I'd like to get in a great attitude of worship before we get into the preaching of the Word of God. Glad that you're here today. Some of you are here for the first time. Uh, don't be afraid. Some of them are strange. The rest of us are okay. No. <laughs> We're glad you're here to worship with us today. Uh, I'll need this in a moment. I, this is not a change of clothes. I won't be preaching that long. <laughs> that I know of. We had a great service at our other campus this morning. It's a really exciting time. I went back and pulled out a message that I haven't preached here in, in, in quite a while, and uh, I don't like doing a lot of repeat sermons, you know, and uh, when I was growing up, you know, we had people in my church, and I would do something like this as a kid, we'd, you know, the preacher preached on something, you'd write the, the, who the preacher was and the date they preached in your Bible, I know some of you still do that, because you'll come up to me and say, you preached that sermon 20 years ago, look right there, <laughs> and you wouldn't have remembered if you hadn't written that in the margin, right? You ought to be writing something better than my name and the date, all right? There's plenty of good notes in there to take. But anyway, uh, this is one of those messages when you talk about the blood covenant, that if you get this basic context of this message down today, this resolves so many theological questions that you might have in your life. This resolves so many issues concerning grace, eternal security, uh, you know, the power of God's Spirit in your life, His presence over your life, the authority that you have as a Christian. Uh, so what we're going to do, we're going to build something here in front of you and, and build this sermon from kind of the, the ground floor. So be patient with me. Uh, this morning, about halfway through the sermon, people look and say, where are you going with this? So I'm going somewhere, okay? And I hope we'll all end there together. But as we talk about the blood covenant, as I said, I, I've shared parts of this, and this is really one message out of about four that I do on the blood covenant. I thought this would be a great Sunday to do it on and really felt impressed by the Lord to share this message, whether we've heard or not, because this is something we all need to be refreshed in. But because Easter's coming next Sunday, Good Friday is, is right before us, it's that time of season we just uh, take some extra time to remember all that God's done for us in sending Jesus to die for us. And the power of uh, His resurrection and the, the, the strength of the sacrifice for our sins. So I thought it would be good for us to go back and rehearse some of these things in our own hearts and minds. So we're going to get real simple, but yet real profound today as we share this message. And again, you know, this is one of those things that have been kind of a life study for some, some areas in my own heart and life over this issue. So I'm going to try not to get long, all right? We'll, we'll try to keep it in the same amount of time, but... Like I said, there's about four or five sermons we could just pull out of this and illustrations from Scripture as we talk about the blood covenant and what that really means to us today. How many have a Bible today? You know, we're going to put the Scriptures up on the screen. But if you brought a Bible, you'll notice there's two parts. It's called what? The first part is called... You guys are so smart, man. I'm glad. You... That's what happens when you come to Believer's Fellowship, all right? And then the back part's called... Don't say the concordance, all right? The New Testament. We have the Old Testament and the New Testament. And uh, we need to understand what that's all about. The Old Testament, majority of the Old Testament, and all the Old, I believe, was given us to in Hebrew originally, and the bulk of the New Testament given to us in the Greek. I believe parts were, may have been previously written in the Hebrew, like the Gospels, but that's another story for another day and another argument another time. But anyway, we have these, these two words that we talk about make up, make up the division of the Bible. You have the Old Testament, could li literally be called the Old Covenant, and you have the New Testament or the New Covenant. It's interchangeable words, literally meaning the Old Blood Covenant, the New Blood Covenant. Everything in the Old Blood Covenant is just a type, a symbol, a picture of the, the, of the true covenant of God, which stands from time and eternity. But it's, under, it's important to understand this division here. And even more so, the word covenant or the word testament. What does that mean? We talk about a last will and testament and things like that. But let's look at this today, what the, what the definition of this terminology is from the scriptures. This one word in the Old Testament for, for blood covenant was the word berit. All right. The New Testament word is, is the word dithect. And both of these words in the context of their original language have to do with cutting or dividing something. You know, whether it's berit in the, of the Hebrew or, or, or the Greek ditheki, which we get the word dissect something from. It has to do with cutting something. And it had to do with, with making promises or sealing oaths and vows and pledges to one another uh, with, the, with the testimony of shed blood or, or a, something would be, a, there would be a divided victim or sacrifice that, that would be made. These words are used to describe ultimately uh, an ancient custom of ratifying agreements between people by, by passing through a divided victim or cut sacrifice. 
That, that's the bottom line of what the terminology when we talk about covenant and testament. When you look at the Bible and see what the Bible has to say about it, it gets much deeper, much broader, much more glorious as you begin to look at it. Ultimately, let me give you this definition for covenant. A cut covenant, literally. It is a treaty or an alliance, a contract, a constitution, accompanied by signs and sacrifices, solemn oaths, uh, which seal the relationship with promises of blessing if kept, or curses if these promises were not kept. In other words, I'm blessed if I abide by this relationship, this covenant, and I'm cursed if I don't abide by it. It's just, it's just pain and sorrow. Now, there's lots of examples throughout the scripture of a defect, a breadth a covenant made between parties that was sealed by these kind of sacrifices. There, there's God and Abraham in Genesis 15. It talks about the covenant, and that's another sermon in itself. We, we make it too soon, depending on what the Lord does in the days ahead of us. And then there's Moses who confirmed the covenant. There's the, the Gibeonites, remember, who, who didn't want to be destroyed with the, with the incoming uh, uh, invasion of Canaan to, to receive the promised land from God. They didn't want the Israelites to kill them, so they pretended to be from a long way place and came and wanted to enter into a covenant. It was, it was a, brit, a cut covenant with them. And Joshua did that, which he was a little sorry for later. I'm not being more discerning. Marriage in, is in scripture and Malachi referred to as, as a cut covenant. And uh, all these things that we'll talk about, you'll see in a marriage ceremony, whether it's memorial meals and eating cake and drinking and all these things that symbolize the covenant. Jesus uh, prophetically is called the messenger of the covenant in the Old Testament, in the book of Malachi. He's the messenger of the covenant. And ultimately, he is the covenant maker, keeper, and all that the covenant is ultimately. But this blood covenant is the most solemn, it's the most sacred, it's the most enduring of all relationships that can be made. It goes beyond. It is so powerful, it goes beyond even a legal transaction that, that, that the state upholds, all right? It goes deeper than that. This is, a, this is the most solemn and holy kind of relationships that can be established when one makes a covenant relationship with, with another person. So what I want to do, just from what we've done in research and looking at Scripture and studying history and studying just secular history in this regard of covenants as well as biblical history, you can put together about nine steps that would make up the Hebrew ritual of undergoing a covenant relationship with someone. And I want to go over those nine, and I want to use an Old Testament illustration and go over them again, and then I want to bring it to the New Testament and go over them one more time and see what, what conspires in regard to what God has done for us through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The first thing that would be done in regard to a, 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 this, this, this covenant relationship would be uh, step number one of nine is that we would exchange outer garments. Now, an outer garment was something like this, just pretty simple. It might be, have longer sleeves, it might, but it was just an outer garment, you know, kind of like a jacket, a coat, but it was pretty much worn by everybody, this outer garment was. And uh, it didn't say Abercrombie and Fitch on it. <laughs> didn't have Under Armour back here. Didn't have Nike Swish or anything, you know. It, what, what's up with that anyway? Why always going to buy clothes with other people's name on them. So give me something with my name on it, amen? Because in reality, this outer garment symbolized you. Whether it's Joseph's coat of many colors, but I think there was something unique. It's not like they were mass manufactured somewhere down, you know, in China in some sweatshop. You know, these were handmade. They were personalized. They were unique, and they represented, you know, me and it what you were represented you. So in taking these off. You know, and me to take mine off and give it to you was a big deal. All right? It, 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 was, it was the first step here. It represented, you know, um, this person owning it, me. And it says, I'm giving you who I am. I'm giving you what I am and, and what I represent. So it was, it was a big thing. The second thing would happen would be that we would exchange our, our belts. Now, this is not the belt to hold my pants up with. This would be something more like this. would be, would be a weapons belt. Probably with sash or leather or cloth or whatever it might be. And a weapons belt, you know, be something you wear, you know, to protect yourself under your garment here. You had to have a concealed weapons permit, I guess, and probably didn't. <laughs> but anyway, it would be sashed to you, and you would have this sword. Now, most people didn't carry the long sword like you see in, you know, all the movies and stuff. It was usually a smaller sword, bigger than a knife, you know. Uh, it was made for not fighting at a distance, but up close and personal. In fact, when the Bible talks about swords, it talks about the Word of God, doesn't it? 
It doesn't use the word in Ephesians in the Greek language for long sword. It uses the word for a short sword. So we, when we're, it's hand-to-hand -hand combat sometime with the devil. Amen? But what is our weapon? It's the word of God. But in regard to this relationship, I'm giving you and exchanging with you my protection, my support. You with me on that? So I'm giving you my weapons, and in turn, you give me your weapons. And there's this exchange that takes place in that regard where we're pledging our protection one to another. Now, the third aspect, and this is where the cut covenant part comes in, the diathek would come in, is that this, there would be this animal sacrifice that would be made. There would be this, this covenant animal that would be brought before us. And we would enter into this covenant overlooking this animal that would be split in two, down the middle into two parts. And as it was split in the middle into two parts, we would stand each side of it. And each half of this sacrifice would, would represent you, the other half representing me, and that we're entering into this agreement with one another. In fact, the, the, the standard thing to do is you're facing each other, you know, and, and you walk around this particular sacrifice in a figure eight. You walk around this piece, you come around one side, then you walk through the blood of that slain animal and come over to the other side, and you turn again and you face one another. And there's where we begin to seal this covenant. But one thing that would happen here is we stood over this slain animal. We would talk about the things that were part of our covenant. We're saying we're starting a new life. We're starting a new walk with our covenant partner. But we're saying two things. One, that we're dying to ourselves. No longer just me and my life and what's important to me. But now there's someone else involved in my life, this covenant relationship, this covenant partner. In fact, in the context of the terms we'll talk about in a minute, one of the things was that we would point down to the sacrificed animal, the blood spool pooled out in front of us and say, hey, God do so to me and worse if I break this covenant. So we're not just friending someone on Facebook, you see. <laughs> this is a lot more depth and, and, and meaning and commitment is involved here. You didn't enter into these relationships lightly. It was important. Now, the, the next thing that would be done in this relationship would be the fourth part of this. And the fourth part involved us uh, raising our arms, cutting our palms, and the mingling of blood would take place. Now, it, let's, let's skip forward a few, maybe a few centuries. and You see the old, uh, the old cowboy movies, right? The old Western movies where where, you know, Tonto and the Lone Ranger, whoever, they would, they would cut their palms or their wrist and they would mingle the blood, all right? Now, it, we've talked about in the past, and if you study the scriptures, you understand that life is basically in the blood. You have no blood, you have no life, all right? Life is in the blood, it flows from the blood. And so we're saying my life and your life now are becoming one. They are so much intermingled, you can't separate A from B and B from A. They are now one. It's A, B, all right? We are one. We're, we're, we're a new one, and a new relationship has started. And so there would be this part where we'd raise our palms, they would be cut, and the blood would be mingled. S saying this, I'm putting off me, just representing me anymore, having my own life, life focused on me and my, what I want. Now I've begun a new relationship and I'm taking on someone else's life and someone else's nature and there's a commitment that is now involved in what, what's happening right here with us. Now the sixth thing that would happen is after cutting ourselves and the intermingling of blood that a scar would, uh, would, would this, that this would be rubbed in so a scar would be very clear and there would be an evident testimony that you had a, a covenant partner. All right, let me read you just a, a short little snippet. I, I, I got off a, uh, an article the other day when I was kind of going back and looking over this sermon again. Uh, I'd, I'd always heard that Stanley, when he, you know, in, in the 1860s, who was that uh, New York Herald newspaper editor, editor and, a, and, a, and a reporter and a correspondent, uh, the great missionary uh, Livingston, Dr. Livingston, had disappeared, all right, for years. Nobody could find him. And so the New York Herald sent somebody to look for him, uh, Mr. Stanley. So Henry Stanley goes looking for him. And in the process, it says that uh, Henry Stanley went to find the Scottish missionary and explorer David Livingston. Dr. Livingston had disappeared for six years, and Stanley was sent to prove he was not dead. So in 1871, Stanley found Livingston. All right, Livingston, I presume. During his expedition, Stanley came in contact with a powerful African tribe but he was in no condition to fight this tribe. So when his interpreter suggested he make a covenant with the tribal chieftain, Stanley did so. This is this kind of covenant we're talking about. And it required days of negotiation with the chieftain. 
After the terms of the cup were reached and an exchange of gifts ensued, the chief wanted Stanley's goat and nothing less in exchange for this, his seven-foot spear. Stanley reluctantly yielded, but he felt he got the lesser end of the deal because the goat had provided Stanley's much needed for milk for his health condition that he had to deal with. So what good is a seven-foot spear going to be to him? More than, than he realized. Next, the tribal priest brought forth a cup of wine. And the old chief selected one of his sons, a prince, and required Stanley to select one of his Englishmen. Both became substitute for the covenant makers and representatives of the two parties. The priest made an incision in each man's wrist and let their blood drip into wine. The cup was stirred and they each drank from this mixed blood and wine. And the priest pronounced terrible curses over Stanley. Stanley's interpreter pronounced terrible curses over the chieftain and his family and the tribe. Curses that would come upon them if anyone broke the covenant. Finally, these two men rubbed their cut wrists together along with gunpowder to mingle their blood and become blood brothers. And the gunpowder remained in the scar and the mark as a visible mark of their covenant relationship. And you know what I'm saying? This act not only bound Stanley and the chieftain together, but it included the tribal warriors with the company of the Englishmen. The blood brotherhood became permanent and the tree was planted as a memorial covenant. After the covenant ceremony, the chieftain declared to his people, come buy and sell with Stanley for he is our blood brother. And then on, it goes on to tell the story how Stanley suffered no more losses in his supplies that he had, that when meeting other chieftains, he would see the scar from this great warrior and they wouldn't give him any difficulty. In fact, history records that Stanley went on to cut 50 of these covenants with different chieftains. So how profitable and how what a difference it made in entering these relationships that he did it with many other chieftains in his search for, for Livingston as he went through Africa. So this, there would be an obvious sign of the, of the relationship, you know. So the fifth thing is, after that, there'd be the exchange of names. Now, again, names were something important there. It wasn't just a handle you, you went by, all right? It wasn't just a tag. The name represented who you were. Your name is important. The good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, the Scripture says. Your name is important. I wanted my children to learn our family name was important. We don't dishonor the Lord, obviously, but we also don't dishonor our parents and our family name. So I wanted to realize the value of that and the importance of that. But even more so as children of God. Amen. But now there would be this, this, this transition because names, again, represent all that we are. So there'd be a, a sharing of last names. The sixth thing was with that scar, there would be this rubbing in of it. Uh, the first part was just to cut it, you know, and then to exchange names and then to make this scar very visible, which they did by using gunpowder. It really became a blue kind of scar with a palm or, or, or on the wrist. They wanted that to show that there was a, that there was a covenant in, 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 that had happened between me and somebody else so that when crisis came in the jungles of Africa, our warriors would surround his small group, simply holding up his hands would say, hey, there's more to me than meets the eye. There's something else to me that you need to understand. I'm not here by myself. The seventh thing of the nine steps was covenant terms would be given. This is where we would name whatever assets and possessions were involved in this. And it, it, so now that we've exchanged names, in other words, in reality, it's like what happens in a, in a marriage covenant, you know, all, all my worldly goods with the I share. We've exchanged everything we own becomes one asset and one possession. If, if I get in trouble and you've made covenant with me, I can say, hey, where's our checkbook? That's how important, that's how deep, that's how solemn these things were. We could have that permission to ask. The eighth thing was we'd sit down and we would eat a memorial meal. Obviously, we've seen this in the Lord Jesus case where we have the, the, the covenant meal. But in place of the, of the, the, uh, the, the animal sacrifice and the blood that would be shed, we'd eat bread, which represented the body, and the blood, which represented the very life. In fact, Genesis 49 talks about the blood of the grapes. So it is a blood, but it's the blood of the grapes. So there would be this memorial meal. You see that even carried out in modern weddings today where at the reception, the, the couple will stand back after sharing names, exchanging gifts, rings, uh, you know, uh, commit, the commitment to one another, the possession commitment to one another to go back during the ceremony following and feed each other the cake or the, to take the drink. And some people have a lot of fun with it, but the ultimate, there's a deep truth that abides in that simple little celebration and ritual kind of thing in the marriage ceremony. So there would be this memorial meal that would take place. And the ninth is there would be a memorial 
tree that would be planted. In fact, there's millions of trees in Israel today that have been planted. Even on some of my trips to the Middle East, we've gone and we've planted memorial trees uh, in, in, in honor and in memory of those six million plus Jews who lost their life in the Holocaust. But those memorial trees are being planted in different places of the world. In fact, I was at my park in my subdivision and I noticed there was a little memorial tree that had been planted there and given by someone to the park. And it stands as an everlasting and enduring symbol of a relationship that's been established in, 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 in the involvement that's there. So the tree is planted in this regard of the covenant. The tree would be sprinkled with the blood of that sacrifice and then be scarred or marked in some way on the tree so as to bear a testimony that a covenant had been made and carried out. Now, there's lots of other examples of this with Abraham and Abimelech and Jacob and Laban in Genesis chapter 21. But there's one I want to draw out today. And I say, kind of stay with me. We're building this, all right? And this one found in, in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 18. It says, when it came about and he had finished speaking to Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as himself. Verse 3 says, and Jonathan... Literally, if you want the translation, cut covenant. Made covenant with David because he loved him as himself. He stripped himself of the robe. He gave it to David and with his armor, exchanged his swords, including his sword, his bow, and his belt. So we see them going through parts of this particular ritual of covenant relationship being established. And when you look at this story, there's some, some interesting characters. In fact, you know, if I was going to make a movie today, I would probably make this movie. Because there's just so much in this relationship between Saul and David and Jonathan. There's so much just in the story itself, so much prophetically in the story, so much in reality for our lives comes from this story. But let's look briefly at the characters. We've got to, we've got to get the cast down properly, right? You, you had the first character. He's David. He's the hero of the day. He's the giant killer. Uh, David has been invited to live in the palace now that he's killed the giant. D Jonathan and David become the best closest friends possible, so much so that they make this covenant with one another. You know, there's, there's nobody like David. He's, he, he is the, the hero of the story, all right? He, he just walks on another level at this point. He, he's the giant killer. And then you see Saul. You know, well, Saul, he's kind of the villain here. He, 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 he's just the opposite of David. He, he doesn't like David. He, he likes David at first, but then he thinks that somehow David imposes a threat. Jealousy enters in. Of course, one of the reasons is, you know, it's kind of like when David rides into town after a conquest, all the girls lying in the street, David, David's here. David's killed his tens of thousands. All of them. You know, get an autograph. David's here. But when Saul rides through town, they say of Saul, oh, David's killed his tens of thousands. Saul's killed his thousands. As a man, don't like to hear that, do you? Oh, you're good, but you're not as good as. That's the deal. So he gets jealous in his heart. And, you know, he, he just pictures David now as somebody who wants to, he's, he's a threat to him. He can't get close to him. He'll, he'll kill me. David is mean. David is unkind. David is unjust. All the time, David loves Saul. How often, as you study the history of the story, could David have killed Saul? But he chose not to, remember? And then there's, the, there, there's this guy, Jonathan, all right? He's just the opposite of his father. Saul. He's all Saul, but he's not like Saul at all. He's, he's more like David. He's a member of Saul's family, but he really doesn't belong there. In fact, in, in, the, in the course of this covenant, he, he becomes part of David's family. And he, you know, as they, they enter into this covenant, you know, here's, here's Jonathan. What you want to do? Jonathan is there in the middle of David and Saul trying to bring peace. And it's just not happening at this point. And then, as the story unfolds, page two. Part three, Jonathan is married, and he has a son, and his name is Mephibosheth. All right? Mephibosheth is Jonathan's son. Now, in 2 Samuel 4, 4, you can make a note of that, and we can go back to it, read it later. But in 2 Samuel 4, 4, David is now coming to the place to inherit the kingdom that God has promised him, and God is doing just what he said. He's going to remove Saul from this place of authority he's given him. All right? He had the opportunity, and he failed. He didn't do what he's supposed to do. We see him acting in part ways, and he didn't do anything the Lord told him to. He's half-hearted, half-committed, and he just didn't, didn't do what God expected him to do. He has this grandson, Saul does, through Jonathan, Mephibosheth. And it says that as, as David was coming into the kingdom, that uh, 
the, the, the news had kind of come abroad. The Philistines were invading as well. So there's this nurse who's taking care of Saul's grandson, Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth. All right, it's a little hard to say without spitting on my sermon notes. But anyway, Mephibosheth, the nurse who's in charge of taking care of young Mephibosheth, picks him up to flee the palace. I can see this, you know, in my movie as I'm working on, you know. She's running out and she trips over something and the boy's crippled for the rest of his life. He no longer can walk because of this running that takes place. In fact, she takes him and they hide him in a place, the land of Meshur, and we'll talk about it in a moment, in a place called Lodabar. And in the context of the way this story is going to flow, in 2 Samuel chapter 9, we'll read from it in just a moment, you'll see David is now the king. Mephibosheth has been hiding out. Jonathan and Saul are dead. David is taken to the throne. And now what happens here is David doing something so honorable and so true to a covenant that he's made with his blood brother, Jonathan. And in 2 Samuel 9, it folds out like this. Then David said, Is there yet anyone left in the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Because I made a covenant with Jonathan that included his family. And it's interesting that uh, this family situation, we'll talk about it a little bit more in a moment, but this, when you made a covenant like this, they say those African rituals included down to the fourth generation in those covenants when you study the history of it. He said, there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they called him to David. And the king said, are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, is there not yet anyone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan who's crippled in both feet. So the king said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, behold, he is in the house of Maker, the son of Amil in Lodabar. And the king David sent and brought from the house of Maker, the son of Amil from Lodabar. And David said, and Mephibosheth, the son of John, came to David, fell on his face, and prostrated him. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he said, here is your servant. Verse 7 says this, and David said to him, do not fear, for I will surely show kindness for, to you for the sake of your father Jonathan. And I'll restore to you all the land of your grandfather Saul, and you shall eat regularly at my table. Again, Mephibosheth prostrates himself before David and says to him, what's your servant that you should regard a dead dog like me? What have I done to deserve this? And the king called Saul the servant, as I have been said to him, all that belonged to Saul and to all his house, I've given to your master's grandson. And you and your sons and your servants shall cultivate the land for him and you shall bring in the produce so that your master's grandson may have food. And nevertheless, Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall eat at my table regularly. And Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. And by the way, this basically provides job assurance for Ziba <laughs> and his family for the generation to come. And all his servants have a place now. And so here it is. David's remembering the covenant. Ziba goes and tells David about Mephibosheth. David says, go get him. So Ziba goes and retrieves Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth comes in and falls down before David. I'm just a dead dog. You know, and, and, and basically David's saying to Mephibosheth, I'm not doing this for your sake. No, you haven't done anything to deserve this. I'm doing this because I made a covenant with your father. Your grandfather's son, your dad and I cut covenant and I said I, that I would honor my covenant and now I choose to do that in this moment. And no telling what's going through Mephibosheth's mind. No telling what people have told him for, for the years that have taken place from the time he was crippled as a kid to this moment where he's laying before the king right now. Maybe people have been feeling, filling him with stuff and rumors and stories about how da David's worthless and probably even got a David's dead story every once in a while. David's not alive, David's dead. Maybe he's been filled with some kind of bitterness, perhaps, against David. Who knows? Maybe he's thinking, I, well, you know who should really be the king here? It should have gone to Jonathan and it should have come to me. Maybe, maybe this is my place. Maybe I deserve this. Maybe this is what's going on. But who knows what it is? But as he lays there, ultimately revelation comes. He says, I haven't done anything to deserve this. And he says, I'm just doing this for your father's sake, Jonathan. Made a covenant with him. And in that covenant... You know, I said I would do some, some things, so I'm doing them now. I'm going to bless you today, and I'm going to restore your land, and I'm going to restore your possessions, and everything that I promised Jonathan I would do, I will do today, and you're going to be blessed because of what was done with him in that regard. In fact, it even gets down to this. Not only will you get what's yours, you got what's mine. My house is yours. 
You can have it, but you're going to eat with me. You're going to live with me. We are one now. We're a family now. And Mephibosheth at this point, you know, some kind of decision has to be made. And you say, well, there's not much to choose. Well, maybe there is much to choose. Maybe this is the man in, in his heart who's resisted and rebelled against or even hated. Who knows what's going on there? But he's going to have to, at this point, enter into the covenant relationship or not. He's old enough to make a decision now. And he has to make the decision. And he makes the right decision. And in that decision, there's a multitude of things that, that are being said. One, I'm not running anymore. Two, I'm not hiding anymore. Three, I'm going to face my fears today. I'm going to choose to enter into this covenant as well. Now, in the new covenant, New Testament, what God has done for us. Let's, let's watch how this, this pans out in this regard. Because these characters really are great types and symbols and shadows and pictures of what goes on in the New Testament. There's David. And what a great picture here. It's fallible, yes, but we're talking about just types and symbols. All right, he's not the perfect type. Nobody can be the perfect type of God, all right? There's David. And in this, he represents God the Father in, in, in the way we're going to look at this today. A God who so many people have been running from. A God who loves us. A God who's willing to do anything for us. But we don't believe that. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and more abundantly. People say, oh, well, if I give my life to Jesus, my life's going to be wrecked. I'm not going to be happy anymore. Like you're happy now. Amen. You won't discover happiness until you discover God and his mercy and his grace. So here's David. Remember David, he's full of love. He's full of mercy. He wants to restore relationship. It's all, read the story. David wants to bring Mephibosheth back from the land of Lodabar. Lodabar in the Hebrew language means the land of no pastures. Don't you love Psalms 23? The Lord is my shepherd. He leads me beside still waters. He leads me and feeds me in those green pastures. That's not where Mephibosheth is living. He's not in the land of green pastures. In fact, it's a land of no pastures, all right? It's a miserable life without Jesus Christ. Ask me, I know, I've been there, I've done it. Some of you, many of you have been there, you've done that. Life without God is no life at all, isn't it? It's just not anything to... Then there's Saul, and this story, you know, he's the rebel. Boy, you want to know who Saul represents? Me. Don't look at me like that. Because he represents you too. He represents us, the, the neck for the rebel. The part way, I, I'll kind of make some acknowledgments of authority, but not really respond to it. And we just, we have believed lies. It's like the very first thing we see Satan doing in Genesis is lying to Eve. And his, his methodology has not changed at all. He's always lying to us. God doesn't like you. God, you ever slow down? God's going to hit you with a big stick. All that mindset, God's going to make your life miserable. You know, that's the way people live their lives. And this is where Saul was. And then the third character here is Jonathan. He's the son of Saul, all Saul, but he's not really anymore. He's made a, he has a new life, a new relationship in this regard. He, he's, not, he's, not really, he's not really Saul. He, his heart is with David. Now, again, this is one of those types and symbols. It's not just absolutely perfect, but Jonathan really represents Jesus. He's man, but yet he's God. He's the God man. As Cecil mentioned the other night, he says, the first of Jesus in, in earthly form is Established by a miracle, virgin birth. The last in Jesus on the planet in earthly form is established by a resurrection and ascension, a miracle, another miracle of Jesus Christ in his life. The, the quotation marks around his life are showing that he's not like us. He's not anything like us. Why is he not like us? Because he's God. He's God's son. He's of God and from God and in God. So Jonathan, you know, he, here he is. He has the flesh of Saul, but he has the heart of David. Jesus has the flesh of man, clothed in flesh. That's the incarnation, but yet the glory of God rests in him. Picture Jesus in Colossians 2, and it says, In Christ Jesus dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So he's not anything like us, although he's become like us, though he can change us. The third person, like Saul, is this Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth is somebody who's separated and running from God and doesn't want to send it, settle down. But Mephibosheth now... There's been a contract made. There's been a covenant made. There's been a relationship made that he can enter into. And by the way, in regard to your relationship to Jesus, it's not because you made a covenant with Jesus. It's because Jesus made a covenant with the Father. All right, we'll talk about that in a moment. So here we say, we take off and we'll finalize with these nine steps. So again, bear with me just briefly. It's going to hurt some. <laughs> One, he took off his robe. 
The scripture calls this the, 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 the we call this the incarnation, whereby, you know, he takes off the, those external robes of glory and dignity and heavenly robes of grandeur, and he clothes himself in all that glory of God with flesh. If you want to read the full story of that, it's found in Philippians 2, 6 through 11. You can, you can make yourself some notes. But in that verse 7 there it says, He made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. So he, there's this, this robe has been taken off and has been, this, this other has been laid down. We call this the kenosis of the Lord Jesus Christ here. And the second thing else, he took off his belt. And this is important that you, you need to capture this because we, we don't think about this in our, our modern mindset. He took off the robe, which represented enmity, which represented animosity, which represented, you know, uh, you know this is what I'll use against you if you come against me, all right? We are against God. We are born against God. The Bible says that we are at enmity with God. Why? Because we're born sinners. God's holy. God's righteous. So if God's opposed to the unjust, something has to be done to deal with that if we're going to have a relationship with God. I am unholy. He's holy. How can those two things be reconciled? If he's holy, it can't be reconciled in, in, in regards of anything I can do. I can't be good enough. The Bible says, you know, we're, we've all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory. You're never going to get there. You can be as good as you can possibly be. You can fast, you can pray, you can give all your money away, you can join every denomination, every abomination, whatever. You can do all those things. You can go to Bible school, seminary, be a missionary, sacrifice yourself on the altar. It's not going to be good enough because we always fall short of the glory of God. We're not going to make it. We just can't, we can't reach that, that height. We can't, we can't attain to that standard because of sin that's in our heart. But here's Jesus who comes and says, you know, all that resistance. The Bible says God resists the proud. But what's that mean? That means if I try to get to God my own way, that's arrogance on my part. To think that I can somehow achieve that height on my own merit, it's not going to happen. That's arrogance. If you say, well, Brother Joe, it's okay. I've been sprinkled. I've been baptized. I've been a good boy. I hadn't killed anybody. Didn't rob any banks. You think that's the checklist we're going to stand before God with? Let's see, did you rob any banks? Yes or no? Did you kill anybody? Yes or no? Okay. Did, were, you, were you kind to animals? Yes or no? There's not a checklist like that. All right? Did you know Jesus? That's the checklist. Yes or no? Yes. And if I do know Jesus, the Bible says in Colossians 20 that he has made peace with God and me through the blood of, the, of his covenant. To the blood of his cross, I now have peace with God. Bible says, it, it, read Romans 5, we're justified by faith, therefore we, have, we now have peace with God. I don't have any peace with God as long as I'm trying to peace God in my own efforts. I need this peacemaker, this, this stand-in, this, this covenant partner before I can ever be made right. I, I, it, and what God's doing now that when I receive him and trust him, he says, now I'm for you, you're for me. I'm going to stand with you. The third element we said was to cut the covenant. Well, here's the beauty of this. He is the covenant animal. All the liability, all the leprosy, all the ugliness, all the wickedness, all the rebellion, all my sin was laid upon him. The Bible says he who knew no sin became sin that you and I might be made the righteousness of God. In other words, I can take off that coat and get a new one. The cloak of unrighteousness is laid aside. That's why the Bible says put off the old man, put on the new man. And now I am one with Christ. I've been made right by God. And now when God sees this, he sees the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he shed his blood. Because he availed himself. Because he gave his body. Because he stretched out his arms. Because he took those nails through his flesh. Because he wore that crown. Because he received that spear in his side on my behalf and upon your behalf. He's the sacrifice for our sins. No wonder John declared, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Because he was and he is our sacrifice. Now the fourth part, remember, said the arms were raised and palms were cut. A lasting sign of the covenant. This is exactly what Jesus did on the cross for us. This is exactly what the Lord's done for us. I love what God's telling Moses in Exodus 6 when he's preparing to take the people out of Egypt. He gives them this prophetic utterance in Exodus 6 and it's this, he says, and I will redeem my people with outstretched arms. And that's exactly what God has done for us. He stretched out his arm. He said, no man takes my life. 
for me? I give it willingly. And he laid out that arm, and he laid out that wrist and palm, and he received that nail through his flesh on our behalf. The fifth thing, there was an exchange of names. We call this the power of attorney. Jesus gave us the power of attorney here. Whatever you ask the Father in my name. That's pretty powerful, is it not? Name represents everything that Jesus is. That means I just can't go in and ask selfishly because I'm not really asking his name. Then I'm asking my name. What do I want? What do you want? Thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will. And, and as I represent, and I stand before Jesus, stand before God, what, he, what, what I'm doing is speaking on behalf of this relationship that I have with him as his child and as his son. Just like Mephibosheth, I can say, hey, Jonathan did this for me, David, so I, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to receive this. I go, Jesus did for me this for me, Father, therefore I can receive this. Fourth, the fifth thing, the name of the sixth thing is, the scar was made visible to show the enemies. I believe there's one thing that doesn't go away in heaven in this glorification of Jesus' body after the resurrection. I believe the scars are still there. Because didn't he say to Thomas, remember Thomas Miss church that Sunday when Jesus showed up? That's why you can't miss church. You never know what's going to happen. The brothers are gathered and Jesus shows up and Thomas is not there. I don't know, maybe it was raining. Oh, there was a discount at the golf course. Or he read the fishing calendar. It's a good, the fish are biting, whatever it might have been. He wasn't there. And then he shows up later and Jesus shows up again. Thomas is telling that about the time Jesus shows up, Thomas got words like this coming out of his mouth. And don't hate those moments. Well, I'm not going to believe it until I see the scars in his hand. Scars inside. While the words are yet in his mouth, Jesus pops in. Hey, Tom, how you doing? Look here. My Lord. My Lord. And what, a, what a great thing that is for us because we have enemies. The world, the flesh, the devil, all these things. What do we do? We hold up the hands of Jesus. Amen. Someone said, when the devil knocks on your door, let Jesus answer. That's what it means. You know, I'm in Christ. I'm a new person. I belong. I don't have to do what you're telling me to do. I don't have to say what's in my mind. I'm free now of those things. I belong to Jesus Christ. We're crucified with Christ. And at the point of this, of these, these evident signs of, of, of what's been done for us, then there's those covenant terms that are given. The covenant terms are beautiful. I'll take your sins and my Father will forgive you. You know, to, to Mephibosheth, you know, you come on in here, you sit at my table. There's old crippled Mephibosheth, you know. And, you know, he, he, in that culture, in that time, you know, you know it, there were no motorized chairs, David, all right? This guy, <laughs> it's a different world for him, amen? There's nothing that he can do. and There's no way he can serve the culture. But here's David. He takes him in. He's like a son. He sits at his table with each meal. He's treated as a child, an important part of this family. He finds substance. He finds significance. He finds meaning for his life like he's never had before. No longer hiding out in the shadows of a load of bar. But he's there with David, fellowshipping. And the memorial meal is eaten. We see this in the Passover, memorial meal of the, the departure, the exodus. We see this in the Lord's Supper. Jesus said, as often as you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. It's an important part of the relationship. So that whenever we receive communion, we do it with our hearts fully recognizing all that God's done for us, with our hearts clean and our hearts right. Because that's when we take communion. Then you say that the memorial tree was planted. Well, Jesus planted that tree, and it was called Calvary. Up on that hill, Golgotha, where the blood of the Lamb was shed, the scars were made upon him, and that becomes, for the believer, the true statue of liberty and freedom. That's the most profound place. That's why the Bible says we glory in the cross of Christ Jesus, because that's where the covenant is settled for us. Here's David, like the Heavenly Father, who remembers the covenant made with Jonathan. You see this story, and I know Tim's preached on Mephibosheth, and I have before, but the ultimate story in all that is that here's Mephibosheth, run away, hiding. And here's, here comes this servant of David, servants of God. We're to be those Zybas who go out to Lodabar and find those people who, are, who, who need to be rescued in life. It's also a great picture of the Holy Spirit which convicts us of our sin. 
but out, out there hiding with fear in his heart, can't run any farther than what he's already run. Hiding in his own self-sufficiency like us. We're more interested in ourselves, our welfare, drugs, sex, alcohol, materialism, greed, all those things that seek to take our lives from us and destroy us. The things that we think will bring us life sometimes are the very things that ruin our lives. Here's God sending his messenger. And here's Mephibosheth who's living like a runaway slave, not like a child of a king. And the Holy Spirit draws us. And the Holy Spirit reveals this message of God's grace and this message of God's love. And choices have to be made. You have to make decisions. What am I going to do? Will we come in like Mephibosheth and say, I'm just a worthless dead dog. I have nothing to offer the kingdom of God. I can't reach perfection. I can't be holy. I tried. I failed. There's nothing I can do to appease your righteousness. What can I do? And the father says, someone has done something for you. Amen. Just as Mephibosheth's Jonathan did something for you, God says, my Jonathan, Jesus, my son, did something on your behalf that you didn't have anything to do with. It was done for you and done in his name for you. You are Worthless in reality of our spiritual lives. There's no value of us. But when we come to God, He receives us like we are into His family and makes us a new person. Why, am I, why are you doing this for me, Mephibosheth? What have I done? And it gets back to the covenant. It's not what you've done or you did or you can do. It's what's been done for you. I'm not doing this, Mephibosheth, for your sake. I'm doing it for Jonathan's sake. Same thing God says. I'm not doing this for your sake. I'm doing it for Jesus' sake. Because a covenant's been made. When was that covenant made? Well, the Bible says before the foundations of the earth were set. Jesus was crucified from the foundations of the earth. What does that mean? It means that Jesus is not plan B in the plan of God. It's not like God had plan A, Adam, Eve, in the garden, everything's going to be great, it's going to be like heaven every, for eternity. God knew in his heart and mind, he's sovereign, he's omniscient. He knew Adam and Eve would fail. Amen. So he provides an answer long before the answer is needed. From before the foundations of the earth, in the heart, in the counsel, in the mind of God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, Counsel in heaven, and the decision is made. Yes. Yes. yes, Father, I will go. I'll pay that price. I'll do that. So when I come to Jesus, it's not for my merit or my value or my worth to the kingdom. Because of all of sin. It's because of what Jesus Christ has done to me. When we come to this time of a season just to, to remember the cross and remember Easter, let's remember Jesus and all that he's done and all that he's accomplished. And let's make the right choice in our lives, not just here in the season, but daily. Humility versus pride. I'll choose humility because that's the way to walk with Jesus. You remember the story? I've heard all kinds of, uh, of, of explanations of the story when Jesus in John 6 has been preaching. Man, thousands are following him. And the disciples are in kind of tucked in close and Jesus turns to the, to the thousands of people that are just, I mean, I mean it's, it's, it's like a mob just going everywhere, a crowd, mass of people. They've been following to see what Jesus would do and what Jesus could give them. You know, the sick are being healed and the lame are walking, the blind are seeing, the dead are being raised and everybody's getting free lunch. All right? I mean, what, what better deal than that? And then Jesus turns to him and he says, listen, if you do not eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me. And many, it said, departed. Well, because he's talking about cannibalism. No, that's not what he These are Hebrew folks. They understand a covenant. They live under a covenant. They understand the concept that eat flesh, drink blood means we become one. If you're not willing to become one with me, then you really don't have part with me. And that's what happens to salvation. I become one with God. I give him my life. That's how I, there's this transaction, this, 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 this commitment that I give him my life. But guess what I get? I get his life. I'm possessed by his glory and his, his son and his Holy Spirit and his grace and his word. What better could that get? But the choice still has to be made. The scar is made. Guess what? The Bible says now we have been sealed until the day of redemption. There's a mark upon our lives that God puts on us when we become His, and it's the mark of His Holy Spirit living in us. 
Let me just close with this scripture and we'll be done with this passage for now. But I think there's plenty for us to chew on over the week. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus. I like that, our Lord Jesus. He's mine, all right? That great shepherd of the sheep. How did he do that? Through the blood of the everlasting covenant. You're, you're, in a, you're in a relationship with God now. You, you have peace with God now. Jesus is your shepherd, committed to care, protection, provision for your life now. How'd that happen? Through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Now, what's he wanting to do with me? Just let me sit on, occupy a seat in church? No. He's wanting to make me perfect in every good work to do his will. That my life would be that which is well-pleasing in his sight. The only way to do that is through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So be it. That's it. Praise the Lord. Signed, sealed, delivered. We have a relationship with God. And I, I believe there's probably some folks here today, you're like Mephibosheth. You're hiding in the shadows. Well, you don't know what I've done. I just messed up so bad. It's just, I didn't know there's any way to make it right. Hey, you're still listening to lies. Well, knocking at the door of your heart is that servant of God, the Holy Spirit of God saying, come, let us reason together, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. The Holy Spirit's dealing with you and calling you and urging you. It's time today, if you hear his voice, not to harden your heart, but to surrender your heart. Let God do in you that which brings him glory, that which is well-pleasing, and that'll bring, that which will bring life and abundance and grace to your own life. Where are you in your relationship to this whole covenant issue? You've either given your heart and your life to Jesus or you haven't. I mean, that's pretty much simple. And even in that, where are you? Are you living like a runaway child? Where are you? God has done so much for us. How can we sit back and resist any further? Would you stand with your heads bowed?